So I'm very familiar with what you guys do and how you operate. Um, when they asked me to do this, I thought, well, is there one magic bullet to reducing food costs or managing food costs? And there's not really. I wish I could, you know, get up here in five minutes and say, this is the trick. But there's not one trick. You have to manage it throughout the flow of food. Starting from the time that you plan your menus and your recipes, all the way through when it's served at your senior center or to your meals on the meals folks. So we're going to look at how to manage food costs throughout the entire flow of food. And if you guys have any questions at any time, just you know, It's very informal and just, you know, pop up your hand if you have the answer in your hand. So welcome, glad you guys are here. And let's talk about food costs. Okay. Your goal is to buy the right product at the right price and make sure it all ends up on the plate at the end of the day. Whatever comes into your doors ultimately needs to go back out to serve a senior. If it's getting lost along the way with waste or theft or spoilage, you've lost food costs. And I'm sure that the budget from the federal government and state and everybody else has not gone significantly since I left, right? You guys are not just floating in <laughs> extra food money, right? What is, what is the plate pop? What are they giving out for? Uh, what does that give you, the CA, for? The whole cost of money. We're going to have to do five and a quarter to about six bucks. Okay. Which is, you know, still very, in this day and age, very, very minimal. So I know you guys don't have a lot of extra money. So as a manager, it's part of your responsibility to manage throughout the flow of food your food cost. Think of food as money. Well, not so much you guys, but train your employees to think of food as money. They look at it as a, as a can of green beans or a case of peaches. But if you could get them to think about it, that's $20 or $25. I always wanted to go through a store and stick Monopoly money on everything so people would have an idea that it has a value. If they didn't pay for it, they don't really care, right? You're just like, eh, I'm not going to scrape your can and I'll just throw it away. Or, eh, it's only an extra can. But if they use an extra can every day for your 254 serving days and that can is worth $5, you know, you've got, what is that? You could lose 10% of what you purchased. 
So if you paid twenty dollars for a sack of onions, you're losing two dollars off of that sack of onions. And if you need five sacks, that's ten dollars right there. Um, spoilage, you have to make sure that what you bring into your operation stays there, stays in good shape so that you can use it. Uh, another area that you have to deal with is theft and pilferage. Um, internal and external. We don't have so many opportunities for external theft uh, as we do internal theft because you really don't serve customers that come into your restaurant and things like that. Uh, but there is plenty of opportunity for internal theft, especially a food product from your employees. So we'll talk about ways to address that. Now standardized recipes. This is where we start planning to control our food costs. Um, Standardized recipes are the cornerstone of producing consistent, high-quality food products at an established cost. This is where you plan how much it's going to cost you to produce those meals. And you have to have an accurate, standardized recipe that everyone uses all the time. It shouldn't matter if I make it, or if Sonia makes the recipe, or if Gilbert makes it. It should come out the same way. It should have the same meal. The only way you can get that is from a standardized recipe. A standardized recipe is going to let you calculate your food costs because you can plan how much it's going to cost you to produce that recipe. Other advantage of using a standardized recipe is after purchasing, you know exactly how much to order. Uh, correct amounts of nutrients in each serving. That's very important for you guys as providers is to have those certified menus so that you know when you get audited that you are providing the right amount of meat or meat alternative, vitamin A, vitamin C, all of that. And you can get that from your standardized recipe. More importantly, you can produce an accurate production sheet. This is where you can say, all right, I want you to make X amount of this product to your cooks. And so you avoid that overproduction or those leftovers. It also helps with inventory control because you know how much you should have in stock. And it also helps with employee training. If they have a recipe to work with, you know um, that whoever's training them can use that as a guide and show them how to do it correctly. They're not making it up out of their head or, oh, well, we've been doing it this way for 10 years. Well, that's what the recipe says. So let's go back to standardized recipe. So you want to start with an accurate standardized recipe for each and every item that you have. Hello. <laughs> uh, so that controls both the quality and quantity of what your kitchen will produce. Because built in that recipe you have the items that you're using and the exact amounts. So critical factors include cooking times and temperatures and serving sizes so that it's always consistent. If we cook something at 375 degrees and it's supposed to be cooked at 350 degrees and you do it the same amount of time and it's a meat product, what's going to happen? It's going to shrink even more. You're not going to get your yield and so that affects your food costs because you now have to buy more product to add in to make your yield. Also, on the, recipe, on the recipe, you're going to include the name, the total yield, that's what's basically the number of servings, the ingredient list, the preparation instructions, um, and any special methods that you want them to use. For example, you know, do this in a tilt skillet or whatever it may be. After we have our standardized recipes, we can make a production sheet. The production sheet is where you project your meal counts. And what affects meal counts for Meals on Meals in the Senior Center? Well, I gave you some hints right there. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to make uh, Weather is a big factor, right? If you know it's going to be raining the next day, what does that do to your counts at the Senior Center? Drops them. Okay. So you would not call for as much production on those days as you would if it's going to be a nice, bright, sunny day like it is today. How about holidays? Okay. <coughs> right before and right after holidays, what happens to your meal counts? They go down. 
So you need to think about that when you're doing your project projections. Special events, say there's a volunteer banquet at a market night center. What does that do to your meal counts? At the centers of Rosso, okay? Meals on Wheels, not so much. So those are things that you need to think about when you're projecting your meal counts. Um, make a daily production <coughs> sheet based on your projected count. So you should know by the day before what that count is going to be, but you can do these in advance and kind of have a, a ballpark figure because your counts pretty much stay the same. But for those special events and things that happen, you would want to change them. So here's an example of a production schedule. Not anything we would have on our menus, primarily, but <laughs> <laughs> we might have the broccoli or coconut cream pie. Um, you can see we've got, this was made for a restaurant, but you could certainly adapt it to uh, the nutrition programs. Sales forecast, that would just be our meal count. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, 85 prime ribs. We had 15 left over from the day before. For us, it would be what do we have in the freezer for the last four week cycle? Um, how much are we going to add new? And have a total projected of 90. So you can adapt this to your operation to help you with your production schedule. And you would want to do this for every day so that your cooks know how much to make. Um, the next thing on the list is cost out your recipes. You need to have a target of what that recipe is going to cost you to produce. Uh, and it's the cost that you would achieve under ideal conditions. Um, what would affect the recipe cost? Why wouldn't you get that perfect day where it costs you exactly what you think it will to produce that recipe? Waste, theft, spoilage. Somebody burnt dropped something. something. <laughs> Somebody burnt something. Uh, it didn't come out right. They didn't follow the recipe instructions. Uh, it's missing from the freezer. Um, what else? They over the vegetables, overcooked the meat. Those are going to be things that affect your recipe cost and why your ideal or your target is not going to be what you actually attain. So at the end of the day, and at the end of this presentation, we'll talk about how to calculate the actual. So the next step is you have your recipes, you have your production sheet, you need to buy the food for them to cook and serve. So in purchasing, we have something called specifications or specs. Those are necessary to manage your cost because the purchase specification will tell the vendor exactly what you want. What happens if you just tell the vendor, I want onions. What are the possibilities? What could you get? I'm over a The most expensive. Exactly. OK, they're going to send you the most expensive. They're going to send you maybe red onions. What would that do to some of your recipes as far as that color? They're also more expensive than white onions. Uh, if you don't tell them what size you want, they're going to send you, like you said, the most expensive. They're going to send you the big, beautiful colossals, right? Which are like twice as much as just the random pack onions. Um, so you have to tell them exactly what you want. You might even get green onions, which the correct name for those is actually scallions. So you have to say the exact name of what you want. On that, you're going to include the pricing unit, uh, case, gallon, bunch, however it comes, you want to tell them this is what I want. Uh, the quality grade. The U.S. government has graded most of our meats, fruits, and vegetables, which is a good thing. The bad thing is they have different grading schedules for each one of those items. So it makes it a little fun when you're purchasing to figure that out. Now you can go on their website and find that information. That would take another hour for me to do just grading, so we're not going to do that. But you want to make sure you get the quality grade that's appropriate for you. Do we as nutrition providers have to have the best quality green bean on our plate? No. Nutritionally, 
they're all the same. The way they do grading is basically for fruits and vegetables by appearance. So the pretty green beans are going to get the highest grade. The ones that may have a blemish or a stem or something will get the lower grade. Does it really matter for us if we have the best looking green bean? No. Your goal is to save money. So you would specify probably a lower grade so that you can save money. But if you don't say what grade you want, what are they going to send you? The most expensive. Okay, so you have to tell them, this is what I want. Uh, you may also want to include the weight range or size, like the onion example. If you just say onions, they're going to send you the colossal, or you could do with the mediums, or even what they call a field run, which is they just throw it all in the bag, and they're all different sizes. If you're just chopping them up, that doesn't really matter. No one in here is making a woman onion, are they? <laughs> no. <laughs> so we don't really care what size they are, and you can save money if you just tell them you want the field run. Uh, next, you have to put processing and or preservation method. Um, how much do you want your product processed? Let's look at cheese, for example. Um, how are the different ways that we get cheese delivered to us? Anything from the big wheel to a block? to shredded, diced, sliced, sticks, sticks cubes, they're going to make little cubes. cubes. Um, so if you don't say how you want it, then they're going to send you whatever. But if you need grated cheese for King Ranch casserole and you get diced, that's going to be a problem for you. <laughs> Uh, but it, the less processing that there is, the more money you save. So if you buy the big block of cheese and shred it yourself, you're going to save a lot more money than if you pay somebody to do that. So the processing is important for you, as well as intended use. And that goes to all your specs. What are you going to use this product for? That's going to build the rest of the information on your specification. Other things you might include on there would be color, uh, for example, the red onions or white onions. If you have a packer or brand name that you'd like to use, you would want to put that on your spec. Uh, yield grade. Um, there are some meats that are graded for yield based on how much fat content they have. So the higher the yield grade, the less fat content they have. So that might be an important consideration for you because if you get something with a low yield grade and you cook it off, you end up with a lot of grease that you just have to throw away versus if you put the right yield grade or even the right fat content in your ground beef specification. Point of origin may be important for you. Uh, an example is when we have problems with um, which one was it? salmonella in tomatoes a couple years ago and they traced that back to Mexico. Well, you wouldn't want to say, I'll take the Mexican tomatoes because you don't want a foodborne illness outbreak among your seniors. So you're going to say at that time, I want the tomatoes from Florida or California or wherever else they were producing at that time. Uh, degree of ripeness is also important for you. If you're ordering bananas, do we still have bananas on the menu? Okay. Yes. You're going to want to put green tip bananas. Uh, otherwise, they could send them to you fully green, which no one can eat, or too ripe, which are good for banana bread, but not for transporting to senior centers. So degree of ripeness can be really important. Uh, form relates to processing how you want it to come to you. Uh, expiration date. You may want to put on your specification, especially for dairy. Uh, we'll not accept expiration dates uh, later than one week from say delivery. So that gives you time to use the product. Um, and then if there's any chemical standards, for example, if you want to specify you want organic product, you know, like that, right? <laughs> or <laughs> um, if you want to put that you don't want it chemically, if you don't want it irradiated, um, things like that you put for chemical standards and then any instructions to vendors, like no deliveries between 11 a.m. and 1 a.m. or no, 11 a.m. <laughs> no one's going to be there anyway. Um, so those are things that you would put on your spec as well.
Okay, now that we have told the members exactly what we want, we're ready to order. So that means you actually have to physically check what's in your inventory to see what you still need. You can't do an order sitting at your desk. You have to eyeball it and see what's there because we may have lost stuff due to waste, theft, spoilage. So we need to make sure that we actually have. And you can use an inventory sheet and car stock formula to determine what you're going to order. So I gave you guys a very basic formula there on how to calculate car stock. Now, and the formula is par value minus on hand, which you already have, plus any special orders equals your order amount. You set the par value, whatever that is, <laughs> as a manager, that is part of your job is to say, this is how much I want in stock. And you can adjust that based on your projected meal counts. So if it's going to be lower at one point, you can lower that par stock. Uh, but for you guys, you're really consistent as far as uh, what your service levels are, so you're not going to mess with that too much. But if you were a restaurant on the island, what's your par stock level going to be in July? Way up. January? Way down. Uh, so you can adjust it to whatever you want. <coughs> so here's a car stop example. We have hot wings and ribs. I must have been craving those. <laughs> <laughs> and fried rib. I don't think it's lunchtime for this meal. Where's the potato salad? Hmm? Potato salad. Potato salad. <laughs> Maybe some beans. <laughs> But we have a, a brief description for ourselves. Uh, it's 15 pounds individually quick frozen. It comes in a case. We have six on hand. Uh, I'm sorry, we need six for our car value. We have two on hand. We have a special order of three, so we need to order seven using the formula I just gave you. So it's really very simple. Um, you always want to round up on your cases, never round down. Because you always want to have just a little bit of safety stock. Um, you don't want to order exactly what you need. You want to have maybe a 5% pad on there. Uh, in case your counts go up, you want to have a little bit extra. All right, so we've done our recipes, done our purchasing, ordered the food. Now it's time to receive it. And the thing to remember is quality control at the point of receiving. Your food is never going to get any better than it is at your back door. So once you bring it in, it's not going to magically improve. So you need to check for quality and make sure you're getting what you pay for. This is the time in receiving that you can say, I want it, I don't want it, send it back, this is the right product, it's the wrong product. And here's where you can lose a lot of money if they send you the wrong product and no one catches it or they send you a bad quality and no one catches it. So it's really important that your receivers are well trained in what the product should look like, how to read labels, and how to check for quality and quantity. So to do good receiving, you should have receiving facilities that are well lit, large enough to work in, so that you can open cases, check them, um, reasonably secure, they shouldn't be outside, for example, it should be indoors where you can check them, and convenient for both drivers and receivers. Uh, you should have appropriate <laughs> receiving hours. That means for your operation, not for the vendor. So if you cannot take them at 10 o'clock to noon because your Meals on Wheels drivers are coming in and out, then you say, I want it at 7 a.m. or whatever time. You're the customer, you're paying for it, you get to call the shots. You tell them what time is good for you so that you have someone that can devote time to doing proper receiving. You want copies of specifications there so whoever is doing the checking can say, you know what? Okay, it says beef, breaded beef patty, but let me just check and see if it has a TVP in it or if that's the right product number. If it's off just by one number, if it's a 12 instead of an 11, that could mean a different product size and you wouldn't get the yield out of the box. Or it could be that the ingredients are different and it's not what is on your, what you're ordering, it could cost you more. So check the product numbers, read the labels, make sure it's what you ordered. 
Uh, so that's why you want copies of purchase orders for the receivers as well, so they can check amounts. How much did we order? How much did we get in? If they might try to send you extra cases. We have this one vendor that whenever the salesperson goes on order, goes on vacation, he will add extra stuff to our order. What? <laughs> like, we're not going to notice that? Okay, maybe we do, but not everybody does. So that's their opportunity to make some more money. So you want to make sure that you're double checking.
in each case. So, you know, your drivers are also a way that you can lose money. Uh, don't sign for incomplete orders. Um, if the produce company says, oh, okay, I'll bring it back later, just <laughs> sign here. No, 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 no. Don't ever sign for anything that you didn't receive. Because you call them later, hey, you're going to bring my tomatoes? Well, you already signed for them, you got it. So don't ever sign for anything you didn't receive. And then spot check portions for proportion weights. If you're ordering a three and a half ounce chicken breast, you want to make sure they're all about three and a half pounds and not four, four, sorry, three and a half ounces, not four ounces or four and a half, because that's going to affect your deal. You may have ordered 200 pounds of that, but if it's a bigger weight per product, you're not going to get as many pieces of chicken, and you're going to be like, I'm 40 pieces short. What happened? That's what happened. The weight of that product was too big. All right, so in storage, we need to make sure that the product we get stays uh, in good shape. So our dry storeroom should be between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's a little hard to achieve here in South Texas. <laughs> uh, but do the best you can and keep your things in a refrigerated store, not refrigerated, air conditioned storeroom. Uh, your refrigerated storage should be between 32 and 37 degrees so that you keep your food products below the temperature danger zone of 40. And your freezer ideally should be 0 to minus 10 degrees. Again, not always achievable here in South Texas, but at least it should be around the zero range. If it's not, you need to get maintenance on your equipment so that you don't lose products. And then store your products neatly in some logical order that makes sense for production. And maintain your product security. So next is using your projected meal counts and converted standardized recipes. You can make accurate decisions about your inventory levels. How much do you need to have on hand? So your inventory levels, like I was saying before, should be your working stock, which is exactly what you need to produce those recipes, plus a little safety stock uh, in case somebody burns something, your meal counts go up, whatever it is. Um, rotate your inventory to avoid waste and shrinkage based on FIFO. That means first in, first out. That's why it's important that you date your products so that things are rotated. Um, you guys, as managers, are the ones that determine the inventory levels. And that's going to be based on how much storage do you have. Does everyone have more storage than they need? No, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> never, I've never had anyone say, oh yeah, we got it. Uh, so your storage capacity might be an issue for you as far as setting your inventory levels. Item perishability is something else. Uh, you don't want to have two weeks worth of berry products on hand because they're not going to last. Your vendor delivery schedule may also be an issue for you. Not so much here in, in Corpus Christi because we get daily deliveries, um, but for some of the outlying areas it may be more of a problem to get deliveries but hopefully you work with your vendor to get at least uh, once a week delivery schedule. Your operating calendar is something you have to take into consideration because we're off weekends, uh, holidays, and so if it's a three-day weekend, that's going to impact how much food we need for the next week. So that will determine your inventory level. And stock shortages. That is a real problem if we don't have product to make. So if something doesn't come in, as a manager, you need to take action to make sure that you have it for production. And the next one is very important. No product should be issued from inventory without management approval or requisition form. So you as a manager should know exactly what's going in your store storage and exactly what's coming out. Shouldn't be taken out without a written record or you knowing about it. And here's an example of a storeroom requisition uh, that you can use. And this one even has a dollar amount on it, so we know how much is being taken out. Alright, security measures. I talked about employee theft, which is basically, for us, removal of product. Other places, employees deal with uh, cash handling as far as cash registers, things like that. We don't really deal with that too much. 
So the main threat to our food cost is removal of product. Um, so keep all your storage areas locked and secure when people don't need access to them. Um, can anyone tell me the number one way employees remove product from the kitchen? Anybody have a guess? Bobby? Trash can. Yes, sir. Absolutely. The employees will put a case or whatever they want to take in the bottom of the trash can, maybe wrap it in a plastic bag or something to keep it clean, put the other trash on top of it, roll it out to the dumpster, put their product either next to the dumpster or in their car, or they call their friend and say, hey, I just took the, the prime rib out to the dumpster, come pick it up. Friend swings by, picks it up, and it's gone. You just lost a lot of money. So, should you monitor your employees throwing trash? Absolutely. Absolutely. You need to know what's going out your door as well as what's in your door. And food should only be issued with prior authorization and management approval. Uh, it should be prepared only in the amounts listed on the production sheet. Your cook should not say, well, I think, you know, we should do 50 more. No, we shouldn't. We should do what's on the production sheet. Because if we do 50 more, that's 50 portions we're going to have to deal with as far as leftovers or waste or whatever. Um, Maintain an active inventory management sheet. Know what's in your storeroom, freezer, and refrigerator. Um, so other warning signs that employees might be um, walking out with more than they came in with. Uh, anyone that seems unduly friendly with salespeople. Uh, they could be working in collusion with the salesperson or the delivery driver to say, so, okay, yeah, well, I'll sign off that we, that we received that, you go put it in my car, or, you know, you give me a kickback or cash, whatever. It's not that common, but something to watch out for. Employees who hang around storage areas for no reason, uh, ask the question, what are you doing here? Like, you have no business in here. And ask people, why are you here? <laughs> if they shouldn't be there, ask. Uh, people who needlessly handle keys or locks, um, why do you have a key? That's not your, you know, that's not for your position to be opening things. If they take too many trips to the garbage areas, bathroom, locker room, or parking lot, that could be a sign that they're moving product. Uh, watch employees who requisition abnormally large amounts of supplies. Well, why do you need all that? Well, they need that for their, for their barbecue. <laughs> or whatever they're going to do with it. Or some... Um, Gene Fields, who was here yesterday, tells a story of employees at uh, CCISD in the Central Kitchen who were taking product from there and they set up a little store in their garage and were selling the stolen products out of their garage. This was many, many years ago, but um, they caught them doing that. Um, anyone that makes frequent trips to the storage area for no real reason, if they have relatives working for suppliers, that could be an opportunity for collusion or if they frequently stray from the sign workstations. Again, why are you back here? What are you doing here? Watch employees who are seen stuffing boxes or packages under a couch. This is primarily for restaurants or hotels. This is another way that employees move stuff out. They will put it in a lobby area, hide it, and then call someone to pick it up or pick it up on their way out. Uh, employees are seen passing packages to guests. Uh, this would probably apply to a restaurant more, uh, but if you see an employee handing something out of the drive-thru window, hmm, you should ask some questions. Um, you shouldn't permit drivers to be in unauthorized areas. You shouldn't permit anyone that's not supposed to be there in unauthorized areas. And you should not have visitors on the work site, because that's an opportunity again for your employees to move product out. Uh, work with honest suppliers. Employ honest employees, prosecute ones that are dishonest, but do background and reference checks, maybe integrity tests if your uh, agency allows it before you hire them, and then design physical facilities to help ensure security so that you can lock things up and keep them secure. You can use a trash compactor 
to smush everything before you take it to the dumpster. Therefore, you can't take out the ribs once they're this big. So a trash compactor is an option, uh, but a good set of eyes on the trash can and the dumpster works as well. You should have employees enter and leave through one door so that you can monitor them. If they have locker rooms, you should make sure that you check those every day or every night before you leave so that there's not product left in there. First of all, for pest control, and second of all, for theft. Um, and then, again, watch your, watch your drivers. Don't brush receivers. Put physical barriers between people and the product. Uh, so you use heavy-duty locks, good lighting in storage areas. You may want to consider closed-circuit TV or digital recorders to keep an eye on your stuff when you're not there. Uh, see-through screens on storage facilities like chicken wire or something so that you can see when people are in there. If you have a solid wall, you can't see what's going on behind there. And then a perimeter and interior alarm system to keep out um, burglars or anyone external trying to get into your product. Or even employees coming in when they're not supposed to be there, taking product, um, you know, 12 o'clock Saturday night, for example. Um, another thing you can do is separate purchasing activities. The same person who places the order should not receive it and should not pay the bills. Three different people, if at all possible, should do that. Because once one person can do all that, they can control what they buy, what they report came in, and what they're going to pay for. So separate those activities. Of course, compare prices. I'm sure you guys are all on a competitive bid system. Um, if you're not, you should be seeking deals <laughs> about that. Only buy from approved suppliers that are on your list, and watch out for small single service packages. Um, what do employees like to take at work? I mean, things that are conveniently packaged, like a bottle of soda, or in our case it might be a carton of milk, or a few grapes. Anything that they can carry in a single service package, they're more likely to steal. And then restrict access to certain items, your more expensive items like meat, for example. Uh, you should have more control over those. All right, so now we have purchased our food, it's stored, no one's taken it. Now we can do some cooking. So the first thing we do is we've set up our production schedule already. We're going to combine prep duties to be more efficient. So that means if you have three recipes that call for onions, even though three different cooks may have those recipes, you're not going to have all three of them cut the onions. You're going to have one person do all the onions for all three recipes, or whatever it is, okay? <clears throat> so combine your prep duties to be more efficient. That should be part of your production schedule. And establish a fall cycle. It takes generally two to three days for meat or other products to thaw from the frozen state to thaw out in a refrigerator, which is really the best way to do it. If you cook frozen meat, it will affect the yield on it. If you cook meat from a frozen state, you're not going to get as much out of it as you would have if it was already thawed. So it's important that things are thawed if they're meant to be uh, before you cook them. So that means part of your production is you have to plan three days out how much you're going to thaw. Otherwise, you're with the water in the sink trying to thaw stuff out, which is a waste of water, which we can't really afford right now in this area, right? <laughs> and also costs more in your operating. So establish a thaw cycle. Train your staff how you want things done by the standardized recipe. That's going to improve consistency so that it's made the same time, same way each and every time. Doesn't matter who, who did it. Um, it comes out the same, tastes the same, looks the same, you get the same yield. And it also lowers waste. If your employees are well trained, they're not over trimming vegetables, over cooking meat, they're not throwing things out that shouldn't be. A good trained employee will help your food cost. Uh, 
they be? Um, so food costs through simple product waste can play a large role in excessive waste. Again, an example would be if you have an employee who peels too much off the carrot or cuts too much off the ends instead of, you don't even have to cut a carrot when you're cleaning it, you can just peel the end. And that takes a lot less of the carrot off than if you sit there with a knife and cut both ends. You need a peeler on both ends. You know, if you do that for 100 pounds, you know, you've saved a lot of carrots. So think about ways that you can use all of the product that you bring in, that you're not wasting it. Um, food waste is the result of poor training and or manager inattentiveness. Uh, you should be walking around eyeballing and seeing what's going in your trash can, other than the product on the bottom. But you should be seeing how much are they actually throwing away. When they peel an onion, are they just taking the papery stuff off the outside, or are they taking the whole first layer? Well, if they're taking the whole first layer, you may be losing 10% of that onion. If you just bought, you know, $50, $50 worth of onions, you've just thrown $5 into the trash. So, watch what people are throwing away. At Jason's Deli, they give everyone a bucket to put their trash in. And before the people leave for the day, managers go through that bucket and see what they've thrown out. And they use that as a teaching opportunity to say, you know, you didn't have to trim that much off the strawberry or whatever it is. So think about doing something like that. And of course, increased cooking time or temperature can cause product shrinkage, increasing the portion cost. And here is a chart. I think you can see it better on your handout. Um, but if we have 800 ounces of roast beef that's properly prepared, we can get 108 ounce portions out of that, and our portion cost is $4. If we overcook it just by 15 minutes, we lose 25 ounces. We only have 97 portions now, and our food cost just went up to $4.12. If we do an extra 30 minutes, we've lost 50 pounds off the original amount, we only get 94 portions, and our food cost has gone up to $4.26. And so on, all the way down to if you overcook it by two hours, excuse me, hopefully no one's overcooking by two hours, but you could forget you had something in the oven. That goes down to 680 ounces, you only get 85 portions out of it, and your food cost, portion cost has gone up to $4.71. So that's the impact that overcooking can have on your food cost. So to control that, you have to strictly enforce those standardized recipe time and temperatures. Also, be careful of over-portioning. That's why you want to use scoops and ladles to make sure that you're consistent with your portion sizes and everybody gets the exact same amount. If you over-portion, your costs go up and you also will not meet the amount that you thought you were get on your production schedule. You thought you were going to get a thousand portions, but somebody over portioned. Now you're only getting 950, and that means okay, I have 50 more plates I need. I go in the storeroom, open more cans, and there goes your food cost. Um, they also cause unhappy people if they don't get the same amount the next time. Well, last time we had this one piece was this big. What happened? Okay. Well, last time it was over portioned. This time you got the right amount. They're going to be disappointed. Um, even at the senior centers, we have to watch portioning because it, and it's hard with volunteers, it really is, I understand that, but, you know, a little bit of training with them um, helps. It's never going to be perfect, but you do what you can because if one person gets a piece this big and another one gets one this big, well, how come they got the big piece, you know, you know. <laughs> and then you also might not get the deal. Um, and then also use your leftovers correctly. If you can, when you're doing your menus and your recipes, plan on what you're going to do with any leftovers that you may have. You may be able to incorporate it into another menu item. So here is an over-portioning chart. Uh, we have a three pound box of corn. We should get 16 portions out of it. Three ounce portions at 17 and a half cents. If we 
over portion and we get only do 13 portions out of that three pound box. We now have a 3.7 ounce portion, which is going to throw off our nutrition analysis and it's also going to cost more money. It went from 17 and a half cents to 21 and a half cents. So just on one item, you're now four cents over on your, on your food cost. And if people did that on each and every item, your food cost would be out going up. So here's where we're going to talk about how to actually figure out the total cost of your recipe. And of course, we have to start with that standardized recipe. You can't, you know, just out of the air decide, oh, well, this is what I think it's going to cost. Because you have to take into account everything on that recipe, because everything costs something, even your spices. The only thing that doesn't cost anything is water when we do food costing. We don't add water. Uh, but everything else costs us something. So the cost is based on the actual amount used, not what you purchased. So for example, very simple example, if you're going to make a cake and you purchase 25 pounds of flour for $20, your recipe cost for, calls for four pounds. Okay? You're not going to charge that full 25 pounds of flour to that recipe. You're only going to charge what that recipe calls for. And so the first thing you need to do is figure out what is the price per unit? So our unit here is a pound of flour. So to get that, we take our $20 we paid for the flour, divided by the 25 pounds that are in the flour, and we get a cost of 80 cents per pound. Pretty simple, right? But the trick here is your unit cost and your recipe amount need to be in the same unit. So you can't use gallons and quarts, you can't use pounds and ounces. Your unit has to be the same. So here it's pounds and pounds. We have a cost in pounds and we have our usage in pounds. So when we figure out our 80 cents times our four pounds of flour, it comes out to $3.20 just for the flour in that recipe. So you would do that for each item in the recipe. I'm going to show you an example here. It will be a little easier to see. So you do that for each and every item in there. You add the total cost of all your ingredients together for a total recipe cost. Then you're going to divide that total cost by the number of portions in your recipe. Or on a standard recipe, it's called recipe yield. So your total recipe cost divided by the recipe yield equals your cost per portion. And if you do that for every recipe on your menu, you can figure out what your food cost is going to be for that day, for the week, for the month, or even for the year. So here is a standardized recipe cost sheet. This is for beef stew. Um, this one calls for corn. I don't know who puts corn in our beef stew, but anyway. Uh, we have three pounds of corn at 60 cents a pound for a total cost of a dollar a week. You can see that the unit cost um, and the amount that we need are both in the same type of units. Except for, down here we have salt and pepper, which are teaspoons and tablespoons, and the cost is in pounds. Because when you order from your vendor, they don't say there's a thousand tablespoons in here. They do it by pound. So we're going to show you on the next page. There's a little conversion. With spices, you can also do it a little bit differently. Some people do five cents a teaspoon for spices. You can just call an amount like that. Uh, but as long as you include some sort of cost in there, um, you should get a pretty accurate recipe. Okay. Uh, you can see our total recipe cost is forty-three forty-six. We divided that by our recipe yield, which is up top. We should get 40 portions out of that. So when we take the 43, 46 divided by 40, uh, by 40 we get a dollar nine. That's what it actually cost us to make. This previous portion cost right here is what we thought it was going to cost us to make. So that is the difference between when we calculated it the first time, this is our target, that's what we thought. 
This is what we actually use to make that recipe. And so we have a seven cent difference on that recipe. So you have your attainable food cost, which is the first one, versus your actual. How much would you want to sell that before you in a cafe, like 33%? If you were in a restaurant, you would probably, as a general rule, multiply that cost by three and a half. Oh, three and a half. Mm -hmm. Would be probably uh, the easiest way to do it. But there's a whole lot more that goes into costing what the market will bear. Um, you know, are you going to combine that with other items on the plate to make your food cost different? Um, you know, a glass of tea in a restaurant costs what, two dollars? Mm -hmm. It costs maybe two cents to make that glass of tea, but their food cost on a meat item might be 45 percent. So, with the balance of all the items together, would come up to about 30 percent food cost. That's only relevant if we're selling your food, which we're not. So, <laughs> um, but here on our weights and equivalents, if you look in the center, it says select spices. We have our pepper. Um, we have 4.2 tablespoons per ounce, and salt is 1.55 tablespoons per ounce. So, if you were to divide the total number of uh, ounces in your container, you would get the number of teaspoons or tablespoons. And how many teaspoons in a tablespoon? How many? I'm sorry. Three. Three. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you're texting. It's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to be our time. Okay, we're almost through, guys. I appreciate your patience. Um, I'm hoping to too much over my time. But your attainable food cost versus your actual food cost, this is your target versus what you actually produce. Um, and here we have losses due to our overcooking, overportioning, waste, theft. Therefore, it's rare that you achieve what you think it's going to cost you. And so as a manager, you need to determine, okay, what is an acceptable level for us to be off on our, on our recipe cost? And it's going to range for your own facility, but generally, a probably a three percent variance, maybe even up to a five percent variance is acceptable. When you start going past that, uh, then you've got issues as far as your food production, your waste, your theft, your spoilage. You really shouldn't be more than five percent off. Um, two to three is probably a better target. Two to three percent off is probably better. But compare what your actual food cost is to your payable food cost. If it's not in an acceptable limit, you need to ask that important management question. Why not? Why didn't we achieve what we thought we were going to? Is it because we had waste, theft, or spoilage? What happened on that particular day that made our food cost um, not close to our target? Because that way you can, once you address it, then you can prevent it from happening the next time and control your food cost. All right, so in summary today, we talked about managing the flow of food, uh, managing food costs through the flow of food, including our planning, organizing, and controlling functions. We talked about using standardized recipes, your production sheet, purchasing, ordering, receiving, uh, storage, inventory control, production, and then our actual versus attainable recipe cost. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. And does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? Good job. Good job. <laughs>